Good morning. As uh, Pastor Zardi shared, we are right in the middle of the sermon series called Blessed to Bless, the understanding that God gives us blessing, but they're not only for us, but they're for us to bless other people. And today, specifically, we're talking about being blessed to be servants. So God blesses us, and then he calls us to be servants. Pastor Zardi, kind of at the beginning portion of our session, shared a reading from uh, Philippians 2. Let me uh, spread that out, share a little bit more from that reading, and we'll spend our time today really unpacking it verse by verse as the Bible calls us to be servants. And as the Apostle Paul has really clearly given us instruction in this reading. And it starts this way in Philippians 3, Philippians 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves, not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking on the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. May God be honored by the reading of his holy word this morning. Let's come together in prayer. Father in heaven, as your son was a servant, make us servants. Let us give ourselves wholeheartedly and completely to your ways and your truth. Give us deep understanding and devotion to your word. And this morning, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. My Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. For the glory of Jesus in his mighty, everlasting, and never-changing name we pray, and together we all say, Amen. Paul, in giving us instructions on how to be a servant, starts in the negative, doesn't he? He writes, godly servants are not to be divisive or undercutting. If you feel yourself called to be servants, and we all are, uh, check yourself. Are you divisive and are you undercutting? It starts in verse 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. So how in the world did we get divisive and undercutting out of selfish ambition and vain conceit? Well, the original Greek for the phrase... um, a vain conceit is a word uh, that I'll not pronounce correctly, but it's erythaean, and it's defined this way. Uh, it means strife or factionalism, um, rivalry, part, partisanship, looking for a fight. So this idea is of wanting to break relationships apart or always causing trouble. And we're familiar with all those words up there. Even strife we are, but that's the one maybe that we don't use that, one, that much. So let's define that too. The idea of having strife means conflict or antagonism, quarrel struggle, clash, competition, disagreement, opposition, or fights. Paul's saying, look, you're being called to be servants, but if you're going to be these servants, don't have this in your life. And Paul takes this word, uh, erythaean, so um, seriously, he uses it in other places. In Galatians 5, he kind of has this list of dark, sinful words, like here's not what a Christian life looks like. And let's take a look at that now. He says the works of the flesh, or what the world says is valuable, are evident. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, and then right in the middle is erythaean, which means seditions or um, being rebellious, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in the past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So a long list of kind of dark sins. And right in the middle is this idea of being people who break up things, who cause trouble, who are always looking for a fight. Factionalism. If you are to be a servant, and again, we all are, we push that stuff aside, have nothing to do with it. And then Paul turns to the positive. All the rest of our instruction this morning will be in the positive. And he says that godly servants are humble, and they value the interests of others above their own. Humble and valuing other people above themselves. The God sandwich, we've talked about this before. Not a great illustration, but my simple mind, it helps. Like in the morning, I wake up and remind myself that God is the top part of the sandwich. He's the top bun because he's most important today and always. And next most important on the sandwich is everyone else. They're the meat or the jelly or whatever goes in the middle. And I'm the bottom piece of bread. I'm, I'm the least important. I, I don't, you know, I, I don't, um, it's, it's not mentally unhealthy the way I place myself there, but I just get it. I get God's most important, other people are next, and I'm least important. I'll get my things done today, but keeping that in mind. Paul writes, in humility, value others above yourselves. There it is, humility and others above yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. So I wonder how we're doing in this area of humility. Frankly, pretty humble church, I mean that, sincerely, but areas for improvement, sure. How are we in the areas of placing other people's interests above our own? 
pretty good. Lots of really good things happening here, but room for improvement? Yeah, you bet. Old Testament story of Esther. Oh, it's an epic. Read it. It's tremendous. So many epic stories in the Old Testament. Joseph and Genesis and, and Jonah and, and, and his rebellion and the great fish, right? And all the things that Jeremiah witnessed and wrote about. Moses and getting the, the children of Israel out of slavery in Egypt. And then we come upon this um, story of Esther. Read it. It's fantastic. Read it not only because it's a great epic story, because, but because it's God's truth. So let me jump like 80% into the story so I don't have to tell you the whole thing. Uh, uh, Esther is a Jew who finds herself in Persia. And somehow, almost miraculously, she's married to the king. She's the queen of Persia. Read about how all that happened. It's fantastic. And she gets horrible news that this husband, king of hers, has set a decree that all the Jews in Persia are to be killed. Now, she's not sure whether he knows she's a Jew or not, so maybe if she says nothing, she'll be allowed to live. But she can't let it happen. All of her fellow Jews will be killed. So in a sense of humility... And placing other people's interests above herself, she comes up with a scheme that I've got to go talk to my husband and tell him not to do this. There's a problem. You can't just go to the king without being invited and talk to him because you'll be killed. You can't come without being summoned or without invitation. But she's got to say something or else her people will be killed. And here's how this unfolds in Esther 4. She says to her cousin, gather all the Jews in Susa, that's the uh, area in Persia, and fast, do without food. Do not eat or drink for three days. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, and even though it's against the law, uh, I'll go to the king even though it's against the law. And if I perish, I perish. What this woman, Esther, is saying that I got to go do this. It might cost me my life. I might perish. But I'll go to him and ask him to spare the life of the Jews. Someone caught me on the way out and said, what happened? I said, go home and read it. He doesn't kill him. It's an awesome story. But I want you to read it. It's a great story. Um, Everybody was given... uh, Now I'm curious because I keep getting corrected by people. Uh, Is this... Who thinks this is orange, the sheet you were handed? Who think it's pink? Oh, lots of people are going, that's pink. Who thinks it's salmon? Let's meet in the middle and call it salmon. Okay. Take out your salmon piece of paper, please. Really do it. Really look at it. Would you fill it out? Would you put your name at the top and your email on the line below it? If you could put a phone number on it too, that would be great. I'm really going to talk through this so I can see if you're looking at it or not. It's like I'm teaching 7th and 8th grade uh, religion that I do here. Um, so we're going to talk through it. Here are a list of the greatest needs, at least as far as we see on today's date, here at Royal Redeemer. Chances for you to serve. And I'm going to ask you to consider these things and actually check a couple boxes. We'll call you this week. We'll set up a time to meet with you and, and train you. And the biggest need really is worship assistance, believe it or not. On Sunday mornings, the people that greet you at the door and hand you a piece of literature, and then they take the offering, they pass the plates at offering time. Um, first and third Sundays, they serve communion. Not hard, not a lot of time commitment, frankly, an hour or two a week, and you don't do it every week. But we just need a lot more people. Would you prayerfully consider checking that box? These will all go in baskets on your way out, by the way. The second biggest need we have is for Redeemer Kids. It's this outstanding children's program we have during the 930 service on Sundays. Kids go up the steps, learn about Jesus. That's all volunteers. We've got some. We need a bunch more. And you see the specifics there. Small group assistant, small group leader, or nursery staff. Would you check one of those boxes? Maybe it's outside of your comfort zone. Maybe that's not even your bag, but maybe God's calling you to do it. And prayer ministry, we need those folks. We need weekend worship texts, projection and sound and lights. We'll train you. It's a lot of fun. Uh, How about musicians and praise band uh, people? Uh, We love coffee and donuts on Sunday. I do. It doesn't just happen magically. People come early and they make the coffee and set out the donuts and the plates and the stuff, and then they wipe it down afterwards and put it away. Not a big commitment if we get a lot of people to sign up to do this. Would you please consider checking one or some of these boxes. There's a couple at the bottom that don't have check boxes because we want you to go directly to our website to sign up. And the first one is Thanksgiving Care and Share. Pastor John just talked about it this Thursday. Between 14 and 1,500 free meals prepared here and either eaten by people who come on campus or sent out. Need a lot of help with that still. Please go to our website and sign up. And as he said, we need pies. Bring pies. Let's fill this place with pies between now and 4 o'clock on Wednesday. And the last one I'll mention is another um, one you can sign up for, not by checking a box, but by going to our website. Night to Shine, it's a fantastic night. We put on a prom for adults with special needs. It'll be February 9th, just down the road at the Best Western, a mile and a half away. I have to tell you, I've been volunteering for a couple years. It's one of the happiest days of my life. I'm not exaggerating. I drive home so full of joy 
you'll be more blessed than the people that we're attending to. Would you, would you sign up for that? Now, we're asking you to do this, and I'm really asking you to write your name and email and check a couple boxes, put it in the basket. But here's the deal. I get it. I've been in your place before. The guy at the front asks you to do something, and you know he can see you, so you're pretending to look down and just get through this part of the sermon. Let's get to the prayer and go home and watch the Browns. I get it. (laughs) I'm not up here to guilt you or to pour it on or to press press my thumb and say, but we want to let you know there's needs, right? This just doesn't happen. And we're called to be servants. And you come on the weekend, and I'm glad you come, and you get a lot out of it. We hear God's word. You'll enjoy the holy meal. Yes! But it's also a church service. You are coming to serve in some way. Not every weekend, but some. And we need help. We're letting you know of the need. So please um, wholeheartedly check these boxes, put it in the basket. A couple more things on this. Um, It's not a guilt. It's a call. It's the Holy Spirit touching your heart right now in this sermon. And you're going, yeah, I I could do that. Plus, it'll be fun. You'll meet people. You're serving. And he'll equip you. The Holy Spirit will equip you. Don't go, oh, no. We'll train you. Most of this is pretty easy stuff. Some of it a little more complicated, but we'll train you. And he'll empower you. He's not calling you to do something he's not going to empower you to do. One more thing. If, If you're like me, the two reasons I would not check a box or turn in the paper is because I'm lazy or because I'm afraid. And maybe that's you, and I don't mean to insult you, but we all know each other, right? If you're a little bit lazy and don't want to do it, let me encourage you, just let, let that go. Just commit to it, something. Let the Holy Spirit lift that from you. If you're afraid, let that spirit of fear just be lifted out of you. We'll, we'll train you. The, the Lord will be with you as you're serving. Yeah, please fill those out. Put them in the baskets on, on your way out. This Thursday, uh, you'll meet with family, most of you. It'll be wonderful. Food, football, laughter. It's going to be fun, grateful. Some people do it today. I just found out some people are having Thanksgiving today. That's fun. Some on Wednesday, some on Friday. But for some of you, it's, oh, no, because she's going to be there. Or, oh, gosh, he's going to be there, and he doesn't stop talking about politics. It's hard, right? Like that one or two or three people are there, and it's not joyful. It's yucky. So let me ask you, as people who are thinking about being servants and humble and placing others above yourself, will you, in the time between now and then, pray and just say, Lord, you know we're going to be together. We, don't get, we, we just don't get along well, and it's... Would you show me, Lord, how to serve that person? I don't mean just literally handing them the, the stuffing. That's cool, too. But like, just have a spirit of servant, just a, a spirit of humility. You don't agree with them on just about everything, but it's okay. Love them. Talk about some commonality. Um, serve them in any way you can. Being humble and placing other people's interests above your own. Number three, Paul continues, uh, being a godly servant requires a change of mind. This is so interesting. The Bible talks a lot about the way we think. Maybe we don't realize that a lot. Think about what it means to be a a servant. Paul writes, in your relationship with one another, right? In the way we get along, have the same what? Mindset. Think the same way that Jesus thinks. See, here's what's going to happen. You're going to hear this message about servanthood today, and we're going to pray about it. We're all going to go, Lord, please make me a servant. And tomorrow morning, it's all going to be the same. Nothing's going to be different. It's not magical. Like, wow, I'm suddenly a servant. You have to decide. You have to think like Jesus thought, like he decided to be a servant. He decided to put his priorities aside just as he's calling us to. So think about it. Make, make up your mind. Have the mindset of a servant. Decide to be humble and to place other people above ourselves. Tomorrow morning, wake up the, with the idea of the God sandwich, right? God is most important. Other people are next. I'm least important. It'll all get done by God's grace, but that's my priority. The Bible talks about this idea of thinking like God and having a fresh and a renewed mind, right? We read about it in Romans 8, Those who live according to the flesh or the priorities or the things that the world says are good have their minds. They think about what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the Holy Spirit, with God, have their minds set or think about what God, the Spirit, desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death. But when we think godly things, when we jive with the way the Holy Spirit thinks, there's life and there's peace. And so maybe we need God to help us think about what we think about. The psalm writer did. He writes in Psalm 26, test me, Lord, and try me. Then he writes, examine my heart and my mind. Lord, look at my motives and the way I think. Take a long, hard look, God, at my thoughts and tell me what you think. There's a pastor named John Piper. He's a Baptist. Oh, we disagree with some important stuff with old John. But I think he gets it right here in a list of three things on how to think God thoughts. Like, that's a nice idea. I want to think like God, but what does that mean? 
Well, he breaks it down for us here. I don't have any place for you to write it on your outline. I'm sorry, but let's talk about it here briefly. First of all, dedicate our minds to knowing him. Do you know him? How do we know God? By, by reading his Bible. Big push here at Royal Redeemer for Bible literacy, that we all would have a really firm grasp about what's in the Bible. Read your Bible. Do it at home. Do it in groups. Do it together. Do, know what's in the Bible. Secondly, thinking clearly and truly about him so that we don't have false ideas in our minds, in our meditation. Lots of us have ideas about God, and they're just not true. We thought of them ourselves, or someone told us, we read it, but it's not in the Bible. It's made up, or it's a falsehood. Meditate on truth. And finally, not being satisfied with merely an intellectual awareness of God, his attributes, his character, and acts, but we intentionally devote our mental effort to serve our affections or the emotions. Our emotions are engaged, our affections. It, 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 the, the truth in our mind actually lives itself out in servanthood. Number four this morning, godly servants are more like bond servants. Some of the translations translate, translate Paul's Greek into this idea of being a bond servant. and It reads that way in the New King James, uh, Christ Jesus who being the form of God did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation. And this Jesus took the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So for our purposes this morning, a bondservant is not a slave. It's not someone who has no rights. Or it's not someone who's abused and held captive. A bondservant is actually someone who does it voluntarily. They're people who found themselves in debt, some kind of debt, financial debt, legal debt, and someone got them out paid uh, the finances or got them out of legal trouble, and now joyfully, because of what has been done for them, they attach themselves to that person as a bond servant. I belong to you because of what you've done for me, and I do it joyfully and volunt voluntarily because of what you've done for me. That's what we are with Jesus. We're not slaves to him, but we are bond servants because of what he's done for us. That means that as bond servants, we give ourselves completely to God. We hold nothing back. We are his we belong to him. The Bible speaks about this clearly. Maybe sometimes we deny it. Romans 14, if we live, we live for the Lord. And if we die, we die for the Lord. So whether alive or dead, read that last part with me, we belong to the Lord. You're not your own. You belong to God. But it's a joy, joyful thing to belong to God, but you're not your own. He bought you out of death. Pastor already talked about it a moment ago going to the cross for you. That's the price that it costs to get you out of sin, to get you out of an eternity away from God. The Bible uses strong languages like hell and gnashing of teeth and fire and darkness and torment and aloneness. My goodness, that's all of us because of sin. Jesus bought us out of that, that trouble. And now because of what he's done, we joyfully give ourselves to him. We follow him. And we give ourselves in bond service to what is his priority. I've used this illustration before. I, I like it because it speaks to my simple mind. The only problem is it's almost certainly not true, but we'll use it anyway, and maybe you've heard this before, but it speaks to me. Um, Abraham Lincoln was walking past a horrible place, a, a place of a slave auction. Deep sin, darkness, and evil. And his heart is moved by the wretchedness that's happening there. So he goes up and he sees the woman that's being sold, and he loves her and bids a high price to win her. And he, he wins and takes her by the hand away from that awful place. And now it's a place of peace in a field by a big tree. And he says, I love you, and I paid a high price for you. And I go, go be free, find a husband, have a family, live joyfully, enjoy life. And he turns around and walks away, and she follows him. He turns around, no, you don't understand. I love you, and I paid a great price to set you free. Now go, be free, liberty, find a family, live a great life. And he turns around and walks away, and she follows him. And he turns around, and he says, why are you following me? And she says, why would I want to be with anybody else? That's who Jesus is, is to us, church, that why would I want to be with anyone else except the one who bought me out of death and despair, confusion, blindness, eternity away from him? It cost him his life. Who could love me like that? Nobody. So Jesus, I want to walk with you. I want to follow you. Oh, I'll stumble. I'll mess it up. But you've got me. You're pulling me along. And because of that, now I'm called to service. Service in the church to love him and love others. Service outside of the church. We commit ourselves as bond servants, kind of attached to him and pledged to him. Number five, godly servants are obedient even unto death. Paul gets extreme here. He says, here's what Jesus did. And here's who we are as his servants. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on this, but 
Paul writes, Jesus humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. For, for, the, for our purposes this morning, that simply means that we don't give up being servants even when it's hard. Being a servant is hard. I mean, serving on Thursday, uh, Thanksgiving meal, that'll be hard, but that'll be a lot of fun. Gravy and, and people who are grateful and Thanksgiving and yay. But sometimes it's really hard. Sometimes it stinks. The Bible says don't give up when it's hard. We are pledged to do this even, even unto death. Three things to talk about at the bottom of your outline. These are your next steps. I'll spend a little more time with these than I usually do. Number one, read the whole entirety of Philippians 2, 1 through 11. I, met, I read the middle part for us today. But again, in an effort to get Royal Redeemer super biblically literate, we want you to read context, right? What are the verses beforehand? What does he say in the middle that we talked about today? What comes next? Would you commit to doing that? Number two, find a place to serve here at Royal Redeemer. I think we've made it pretty clear that the need is great. We need help. Find a place. Find a couple of places. Bring your family along. going to be a lot of fun. And finally, number three, uh, we made the print small. I know, I'm sorry, but we wanted to squeeze the whole thing in. Uh, Hang hang that piece of paper, that outline somewhere where you can see it all week. Uh, Read through this passage this afternoon again and tomorrow, maybe twice tomorrow, maybe three times on Wednesday. This is so much good for us. It reads this way. Same thing we've talked about all morning, different translation. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. Help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself. He had equal status with God, but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to those advantages of the status no matter what, not at all. When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity, of being God, and took on the status of a slave, becoming a human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. The worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that um, our King Jesus is a servant and that he served us and serves us. And now joyfully, not like out of a spirit of, oh gosh, I got to go do this at church, but joy, I get to do this. I get to be a part of his kingdom and family. Move all here this morning to um, think about service and many to commit. Um, We we need help, frankly, to to get her done here at Royal Redeemer. So let the people step up. Again, uh, in a spirit of grace, joy, and celebration, voluntarily um, celebrating the privilege of doing this. We pray this all in Jesus' name. And together we all say, amen. Thanks for taking the time to learn a little bit more about Royal Redeemer. We want you to be a part of our Royal Redeemer family here. May God richly bless you and guide you, and I truly look forward to seeing you soon.